Blog Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to a September 24, 2008 segment from the Kentucky Water Fuel Museum. With us this afternoon is Don Gable from Erie, Pennsylvania. Don, are you with us? Yes, I am. Oh, welcome to the program. Thank you. Okay, you have the unique distinction of being a person who has gone in search of Stan Meyer's famous uh, water fuel cell powered dune buggy and you succeeded in finding it, and you've even begun acting as a representative of the man who presently holds Meyer's dune buggy, as well as other files and computers and devices, water fuel cells, and you have uh, attempted to uh, direct interested persons to this individual who does not wish to be named. And so we'd like to talk about how this all came about and what you and uh, another acquaintance um, saw when you went to inspect these items. Okay. Well, um, back in the beginning of the year, I come across the uh, the article in the Columbus Dispatch by that uh, Dean Narcisco talking about uh, going and seeing the buggy. And I'm thinking, geez, it's still in the area. So I set out to see if I couldn't find it. So I started, first place I tried was calling the uh, Columbus Dispatch and get a hold of this dean and I was unable to contact him at all. I sent him emails, no returns. <coughs> so I just kept watching the uh, the fuel cell groups on the net. And then I uh, started seeing these guys come in there saying they were from the Grove City area or close to Grove City. So I started contacting some of these people and finding out you know, if they knew anything. <coughs> I tried for well, it was probably two or three months of talking with people through emails and on the phone that I came across a, a guy by the name of Steve. And him and I started talking, and we put our thoughts together. And then since he lived in that area, he started uh, searching for names that I threw at him. And, and one thing led to another, and uh, I started making phone calls and come across the guy who was just looking for information. And he's like, well, I've got everything. So I talked with him for a good month uh, trying to just let me come down and see everything. Well, he uh, he was reluctant to do it at the time because... At the time, I didn't know, but he was in negotiations with a company that was looking to purchase it. So, oh, really? So he was reluctant to uh, let me come see anything and fear it might jeopardize his negotiations. But So I talked with him for like a month until he finally uh, said that he was done waiting on this group to um, come up with the funds they were offering. So we <coughs> came up with that August 16th deadline. And at that point is when I started putting it on the groups, letting people know that I found this thing and then it's available for sale. So, Okay, so he allowed you started. and this uh, Steve to uh, come down and actually look at, look the stuff over, huh? Yeah, I was working with the owner for a good month, you know, fielding calls and messages, passing them on to him. And then out of the blue, he says one day, he says, well, uh, he says, you know, for, for all your help, he says, uh, he says, I'll, you can come down and I'll show you the stuff. You know, well, that's pretty he, neat, isn't it? Yeah, he was more interested, you know, if you had the money and can show that you have money in your series, then he would let anybody come see him. So if you have money and want to go, uh, may put in an offer, he will uh, He will let you see the stuff. I mean, he, he, I've already sent a few people to him. They've went and saw the stuff. So I'm not the only one that's seen it so far. Okay. But uh, why don't we uh, get a... Uh, recounting of what happened the day that you went to see it. So we have the Columbus Dispatch article from last summer where Dean Narciso apparently went to the home of Charlie Holbrook. Is that the one mentioned that's in the who, article? Yeah, that's who I believe he went and saw, but uh, I um, I never got a hold and confirmed that. So. And Mr. Holbrook died earlier this year? Yeah, he died in the end of January. He was 73. Yeah. Okay. Now, I interviewed Mr. Holbrook and his wife back in the summer of 2005, and um, we had about a four-hour conversation. And at one point during the conversation, he started to get up, in, implying that he had something to show us. Mm -hmm. My wife and I were sitting in his living room. This was a Saturday evening, the middle of summer. And no sooner did he begin to get up that he changed his mind and mm -hmm. said, nah, and I pressed him to find out what it was he was about to show us, but he, he didn't want to. Yeah. It sounds from the uh, Columbus Dispatch article like Dean Narciso, the, the columnist who wrote the article, uh, the conditions for him seeing it and then mentioning it in the, in the article, it's pretty obvious that it was a, a hushed kind of thing. Right. 
he mentions Mr. Holbrook in the article, but he doesn't connect the viewing of the dune buggy with Mr. Holbrook's home or anything. Yeah. Well, that would probably have been, well, uh, when you went and talked to Charlie, that's probably when Charlie originally came into custody of the equipment, and it's moved on since his death. Uh, it, uh, he um, left it to somebody else before he died, so he no longer has it. But uh, originally it uh, was tied up in courts for a good five years before it was finally granted to the widow, and then she had it for a few years up until the point she died, and then she had left it off. Uh, to uh, Charlie, and then and Charlie left it off to somebody else. So it's changed hands a few times now. Yeah, but it's always stayed in the Columbus area. Yeah, it's still down in the uh, Columbus area right now. It's, as it's far as I know, that vehicle has never left Ohio. No, it hasn't. It's It's been in that same area ever since. Now, so there are Ohio. rumors that you, you'll see occasionally on the Internet, you'll see a story that it was driven from L.A. to New York or something. Oh, no, that was a, um, people thought he drove it, and in, in his one video on the net, it says that we calculate that it would take 22 gallons of water to drive from East exactly. Coast to West Coast. Yes, he never okay. drove it, he said he calculated. Right, and then at one point, it. there was some kind of uh, alternative energy vehicle competition in Australia, and he had proposed taking it down there. But the, the, the competition involved the use of solar panels or something. Mm. And, of course, his buggy didn't run on solar panels. Right. Now, it could have been made to run on solar panels. The, the sure. uh, water fuel cell could have used solar panels as the source of energy. Right, it, it runs off electricity. But I think I, I have in my possession a newspaper article from Grove City wherein he disc discusses this with the newspaper reporter back when this article was written, maybe 20 years ago or so, that they were thinking of actually uh, entering it into this competition that was going to cross Australia. Hmm. Yeah, but that never happened either. That. I've been researching this stuff for two years, <laughs> and then when I saw that article in the Columbus Dispatch, I was like, wow, it's still around. I can see if I can't find or at least find some more information. I was just trying to find people in that area that might have some of the letter, literature, the newsletters and stuff that Stan passed out all those years. I figured somebody down in that area might have something, so I was contacting people looking for any kind of information and you know, eventually hoping to find the buggy and equipment just to go down and look at it and see if I can gain some more knowledge from what I see. And how much stuff did you actually come up with in, in your quest? He showed he showed me everything he has. Uh, well, I'm not has. talking about that. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm talking about oh. looking for literature, uh, brochures, and this, that, and the other. Did, I, I, did I, people come forward with that kind of stuff? No, I never did find anything like that. I just ended up finding the whole kit and caboodle at once. I, I never did get that far. I people I would contact, they wouldn't reply, and I had a hard time communicating back and forth with people. You know, I ask them, you know, can you grab a phone book and, you know, look for this name? And it, people just wouldn't do that for me, you know. It was, it was odd, like, well, just grab a phone book. And then after uh, my friend Steve and I started looking and I made a call, I just called information for a name and got it, called the guy up and was like, oh, I got it. And I called Steve back and told him. He grabs a phone book, looks in the phone book, yep, there's a guy's name. <laughs> it's like, Isn't that interesting? You <laughs> know, I uh, rounded up some, some information on Meyer from unlikely places. Uh, for instance, just this past week, I was talking to a, a gentleman who owns a electric motor shop here in, in Lexington, Kentucky. And he he takes out his wallet and he pulls out a business card from his wallet and wouldn't you know it's Charlie Holbrook's business card for mm. the water fuel cell. Oh, darn. And he's been carrying it in his wallet for 15 years. Mm. When he actually drove up to Columbus and went or Grove City and went to a demonstration, one of Meyer's yeah. investor demonstrations. Yeah, well that's where my friend uh, Steve actually uh, met. Charlie and Stan himself, he used to work at the place where they would hold the meetings. He was in charge of setting up the room, so he had actually met Charlie and Stan like 20 years ago. Now, was this at a hotel? It was um, kind of like one of them halls you would rent for, you know, many kind of banquets, weddings, yeah, or okay. receptions. It was some type of hall that they were renting. Once a month they would rent this, and it was a fundraising thing. They were trying to 
uh, drive, drive up some funds. And he used to be he used to work for that hall there and set up the rooms and he'd come in and do the demonstration. So he got to see the cell in operation you know, 20 years ago, the demo. Very interesting. Well, uh, this gentleman drove the three hours from Lexington up to the uh, Grove City area, and he said that the dune buggy was actually driven during this demonstration. Mm. And he calculated it was about 15 years ago. I'm not sure how accurate that that uh, mm. estimate is. Yeah. But he said that the dune buggy wasn't running very well. He said a dog could outrun it. Oh, yeah. That was always so, a problem, is producing enough gas on demand to feed the motor. Oh, really? Was I, that a problem? Um, I had heard uh, someone had told me that Bob Boyce had went up and seen the thing, and he claimed that there was six of those demo cells in a container that was on the buggy. You needed that many to make it run off of the demo cell. But again, the demo cell is not the, the VIC uh, type system. The demo cells literally just ran off of the alternator, uh, the modified alternator with the electric motor is what run the demo cell. It wasn't the voltage intensifier circuit. Voltage tensifier circuit came after that. It was a completely different unit. The demo cell doesn't use a VIC; it just uses the alternator. The really? Alternator adds, so there's not uh, there's no resonant type driver involved. Not on the demo unit. No, the the resonant circuit came with the VIC, and then that was a totally different cell. It uses a smaller cell. There's some pictures on the internet of these things. There's like three of them bullet together with that hydrogen gas gun that I posted a picture of that uh, the owner had sent me a picture of the hydrogen gas gun but there, there's pictures of it from one of his uh, seminars or shows three water fuel cells bolted together one on top of each other and then two other units one on the hydrogen gas gun they're all bolted in a stack probably about three to four feet high those little things on the bottom the white units are about four or five inches in diameter five six inches tall those are the water fuel cells that run off the voltage intensifier circuit. It's a totally different system. Okay. Now, what this gentleman here, uh, Jim, described uh, in my interview with him uh, last week was uh, a demo cell that involved two plates or ribbons, I guess, yeah. that were moved closer together and farther apart to demonstrate yeah, right. the production of gas. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I yeah I seen that one. He had that one there also. That and what, what are those original. ribbons made of? He thought they were made of copper. Is that true, or is that just discolored? No, those, plates? those plates are stainless steel, just like the uh, tubular ray. That was okay. his very first demo cell. He was using that to vary the capacitance of the cell to, to find the, um, the best spacing and stuff like that. But uh, that one came prior to the tubular ray, and then the tubular ray is what he shows everybody after that. But I got to see both of those at this guy's house. Okay, so maybe we can describe. So the guy lets you into his home, and then uh, what does he have? This stuff stored in his garage or something? No, he had some of it in his house, and then the rest of it was in storage. We had to drive a couple miles to go to a storage facility where he had the, the bulk of the material. Um, what had happened was uh, one of the previous owners had removed some of the main components off of the vehicle, and that's what he had at his home. They had the, you know, the distributor, the water pump, the water fuel injectors, a couple other units that were removed. The idea was if someone was to ever steal the buggy, they would not be able to get it to work without these components. But he has all the components that goes back on the buggy. Okay, so is he implying then that nothing is missing from the things that Meyer had when he died? That yeah, those he, things, none of them have been spirited away yeah. or anything? He's not uh, he's not real familiar with everything that goes on there, but everything that I have off of the have you seen the in, international independent test and evaluation thing that's out there? It's like 200 and some pages long. It has pictures of all the water fuel injector systems, shows all the injectors, the distributor, all the components. Well, everything in those pictures was on the buggy or in his house. So uh, everything was there if you put it back together. Now, was there any explanation given by him as to what happened at the time of Meyer's death with these things? Apparently, uh, from what I had heard and what from various sources, that some things were sort of carried off by different people, possibly for the reason, as you mentioned, so that they wouldn't be stolen by someone else. Mm -hmm. So apparently, some 
Yeah, I'm trying to say from uh, from what this owner says is that uh, after Stan's death, they pretty much came in and uh, locked everything down. No one was allowed uh, near it. It was he's not even sure if it ever left Stan's place where he had it. I think they he thinks that it was all locked down and no one was allowed in. Now, there. when you say they, who are we referring to? The 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 courts. See, when Stan died, he didn't have a will, so. All the investors were looking to get their hands on this stuff, so sure, it got people tied who, up in the courts. Yeah, right. So the courts came in and put everything under lock and key. Now, in that case, what became of the investors' interest in this stuff? Did it dis- disappear? I, or? I, I guess that was uh, dealt with in the uh, the lawsuit or the, the the court hearings. I think that's why the widow had to pay so much to acquire everything. They didn't just give it back to her. She really had to pay for the stuff. And I think uh, if people didn't come in, you know, if you don't show up for a court hearing on a claim like that, then like a bankruptcy, you know, they're you're not going to get anything out of it. So um, he's not real sure. He does. He did show me the uh, court documents. He pulled out one of the books. He showed me the, the case where the guy had sued him. I mean, that thing was like three inches thick. It was all the paperwork from the court hearings. And then he had all the other stuff from uh, stands, but I mean, there's just. Well, of course, this is while Meyer was alive; he was sued. But yeah, there hasn't been any legal action taken by any of the investors in recent. No, months I think that was all washed out in the the initial um, thing. That five years it took for them to decide where to put it. And yeah, it I'll give you an example, out. and this is an example of how information about Meyer's company and his his promotion of his technology and whatnot comes from strange sources. There's a fellow living in Nicholsville, which is about um, 10 miles south of Lexington, not quite 10 miles, and he was one of the investors, and he gave me, as the owner of the uh, Kentucky Waterfield Museum, he, through a friend of his, he passed on to me his receipt that Meyer gave him for $5,000 of an investment into his company. Yeah. And he also had a, a couple brochures from the company, describing the progress and what the plans were for building an airstrip. It actually had a drawing showing quite a few military airplanes, quite a, quite a big yard filled with large aircraft, and so uh, these planes could be flown in and, I guess, retrofitted with water fuel cell <clears throat> power units. Right, yeah, that would have been the, uh, the injector technology converted to injectors. That's what was on the buggy when Stan died. The, the okay, that's what we want to get to next now. Yeah. So you're saying that originally when the first Meyer um, newscast video, and it, perhaps there was only one newscast video made showing right. him driving a dune buggy down the road, right? Right. That was from 1984 or 5? 85, I believe. Okay. And there was never another newscast done showing him driving the buggy, right? Not that I've seen. Okay. At that time, the, the device that was in use that powered the vehicle was a rather large, sort of an ice chest-sized box, right? Yeah, there was it looked like a big cylinder on the back of the buggy, and I, I think that's where people are saying that there was six of those demo cells inside that unit. Uh, the one I seen looked like a big round uh, tank on there, almost like a propane tank, but big. You know, it looked more like a cylinder to me. Um, but there, someone thinks that there was, I, th- I guess Bob Boyce had said that he'd seen it and that there was six cells. You know, I've never heard Bob Boyce say anything about Stan Meyer's work. Mm. Other than well, commenting is, yeah. on This comes from a friend I've been talking to in Colorado. I've, he called me about this stuff, and we've been talking ever since, so we're helping each other with our projects. But um, he had said that he'd talked to Bob Boyce and uh, Dave Lawton and Ravi and all those guys. He he's personally knows them all and talks to him, and he said that Bob had mentioned that he'd went up and seen this thing years ago. Isn't that interesting? That Bob Boyce never mentioned that type of thing to me. When uh, I asked him about Meyer's work, he never... But that wasn't the first time I heard... Yeah. Really? It wasn't the first time I heard someone say that there was more than one demo cell on there. But yeah, in the first original one, you can actually see the alternator with the electric motor on the left side of the buggy, because that's what he was using at the time to restrict amps and allow voltage to take over. 
You mean he was running an electric motor on the vehicle? Yeah, yeah, there was a, you can see it, and if you look at the video, you can actually see the old main electric motor on the left rear corner of the buggy. So he what, was he powering the electric street. motor from a, an inverter? Being probably. driven from the vehicle? Yeah, it was probably run off of the electrical system on the buggy. To, Isn't that the interesting? Yeah, and are we talking that about was a, his, Yeah, that was his early attempt at restricting amps. The, the, the windings in the alternator act like your choke coils, and it uh, restricts amps, uh, allows voltage to go through. Now, are we talking about a modified alternator? Uh, yeah, it's 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 just a deregulated alternator with uh, three of the diodes removed, and then the the armature is powered with uh, you. He was using a, an inverter uh, to uh, while well, he was running. Uh, yeah, an inverter with a AC a variac, a variable AC controller to apply. Uh, he used a bridge rectifier to change it from AC to DC, and he was applying a DC voltage to the armature of the alternator, and then the output was uh, run through three diodes to give it a unipolar pulse, and then that was run right to the cell. And so is that basically all that's needed to do a replication of Meyer's early work? Of the demo cell, yes. It's in that uh, international test and evaluation report that's on the internet right now. Now, who was that report prepared by? Uh, it was... I don't have it copied. It's such a was big that file. Meyer's work, or was, some, was that an independent? It was an independent uh, study done. Um, the, you can get the file right off of the waterfuelcell.org. I believe it's on their website, but it's it's an 88 meg download, so it takes a while to download, even with fast. But uh, in there, it's it's a wealth of information, and it gives you. A picture of that black control panel you see on the video when he flips on the power and he turns the knob, that box is shown in there with the lid removed so you can see it's a bad photocopy. But there's some simple wiring schematics that show how the thing is actually wired and there's nothing in there except for the variable controller with a bridge rectifier. And it goes to your armature on the alternator to apply voltage to it to put your generated voltage out. And Very it goes to the demo cell. I've got an alternator modified right now that I'll be testing as soon as I get it mounted. And this is basically what Dave Lawton's replication consists of? Yeah, that's, Dave Lawton has done pretty much the exact same thing with the alternator conversion, but he's using a, a PWM circuit to control the alternator, but Stan didn't do that. Stan just run a straight voltage into it, a few volts in, and he was running it like 12 and a half volts out or so. On, on the one video, he's talking only about like five point some volts was all the cell was running at. When he, if you've seen the one where he had the buggy running for the first time in the driveway with the demo cell sitting on the ground, where they're sort of hooting and hollering and yeah, celebrating. Yeah, that's that was supposedly the first time the the engine ever ran on the hydroxy gas. And that's Stan Meyer and Charlie Holbrook. Yeah, that was Charlie Holbrook. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Charlie is an interesting, interesting fellow. Um, apparently, he was a skeptic who became a believer. Mm. He said that his uh, initial uh, reason for um, approaching Meyer was to disprove what he was doing, to right. show that it wasn't valid. Yeah, a lot of people get uh, see the light after they do something like that. A lot of non-believers start believing after they start researching it. Yeah, and recently someone criticized me for using the word believer and non-believer. <laughs> they said, this is science. Why are you using that word? You yeah. Know? Well, the fact is that mainstream science denies that this is possible. Yeah, they say you can't do it. And so, I mean, you either believe something is true or you don't. If you believe it's true, yeah. you're a believer. And Stan was yeah. such a paranoid person that he uh, was very reluctant to allow anybody to see anything major or you know, to hook any device to it to verify his findings. He was just so paranoid that people were going to steal his ideas. So that's, I mean, he burned a lot of people in that respect because he wouldn't allow them to test anything. Yeah. So so that's why you either got to believe him or not believe him. Well, what do you think that he should have done differently? If you were Stan Meyer and knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently during the 80s and 90s? Of course, he died in 98, right? Yeah, 1998. Um, what would you have done differently from your from your vantage point now? Um, I would have probably allowed some 
independent people to do the test, you know, but make them sign a non-disclosure agreement that's, you know, that's ironclad. Uh, if he would have just showed people a little more and given them a little more uh, of what was going on, then he wouldn't have had such a hard time, I don't believe. Yeah. For instance, did he ever do a leaders per minute test? Did he ever verify how many leaders per minute he was Yeah, in that, uh, that, that in the independent uh, test and review thing, it shows what that demo cell would put out. Uh, I've got it printed out right here. I can find it real quick. But it gives you all the uh, flows. It was like 46,600 cc's per hour per tube with an input of only so many. Okay, here it is. I got papers everywhere. Have you ever translated that to liters per minute? Yeah, it works out to the whole cell would produce about seven liters a minute at 12 and a half volts input. And so you're saying, how many uh, amps? Okay, that works. Well, you're saying it's electrical watts per tube is 12.5 volts at 4.4 amps. Okay. So 4.4 times 9. So you're taking amps. 7 liters of gas at it 4. Was, it was like 40 amps, 12 and a half volts, 40 amps, and it was producing 7 liters a minute. Oh, using 40 amps of current. Well, yeah, let's see, his power supply was 12 and a half volts DC at 40 amps, 500 watts total, so 4.4 amps times 9, that was per tube. Like I say, this isn't the VIC, this is just the old major thing. So it was 40 amps total for the 9 tubes, but it was producing well, 420,000 cc's per hour. But it works out to right around 7 liters a minute. And you're saying that that multiplied by six was running the Volkswagen four-cylinder, maybe 1600 cc engine. That's what the one guy had told me that Bob Boyce had told him. Yeah. Somebody said that there was more than one of those cells, but the owner only has one, and it's the one I've seen in the videos. Yeah, and is it an alternator capable of powering six of them? You're oh yeah, no, I've, 40 I've amps per cell. Yeah, an alternator. An alternator, like my car, has a 130 amp alternator from the factory. So 40 amps out of an alternator is no big deal. Well, I'm Just talking about a, multiple cells then. Would an alternator? Oh, multiple cells. Yeah. Well, let's like say this was just the test. This is just part of the research off the test. Yeah, that's interesting. But, yeah, I mean it would take quite a bit. Uh, but you got to remember uh, that seven liters a minute's enough to probably allow the buggy just to idle. I mean. It needs so much to run down the road, and how he was controlling them, I, I, I really don't know. But are we talking about the same thing that's seen in that British uh, broadcast, uh, uh, It Runs on, on Water, water. Mm -hmm. when they say that it, he does this cold? Now, right. the 40 amps, to me, has to translate into heat. That doesn't right. sound like a cold heat. Yeah, so we're talking um, about different Yeah, devices. it all depends on you know what kind of power he was putting through it you know, when uh, he was showing the thing. But this is, like I say, just off the test. It gives all the specs on the test and the flows and the voltages and the watch used, and it compares it to the standard electrolysis process. It's all in that file. Very interesting. Well, why don't we move on to his later work that we've considered the, the early cells. What about the um, the use of the... What everyone really is most interested in is the injector plugs, and you've actually held these in your hand? Yeah, yeah. He um, pulled them out of a box. They were wrapped up in paper towels, and he pulled them out and handed it right to me and my friend Steve, and we looked it all over, and it, it looks just like the pictures you see of Stan holding it on the Internet, except for... Now, there was, a, there was a Colorado news broadcast in which he was holding one, right? Right. That was during yeah. some kind of Tesla conference or something? Yeah, he's outside in front of a little Ford or Escort showing how to pull the plug out and put this thing in its place. But it wasn't uh, actually installed on that Escort, was it? No, no, he was just showing people you just pull the plug out yeah. and put this so in So there. is there any evidence that this thing was ever installed on any vehicle? It was on the buggy, yeah. they were. Uh, there's pictures of the buggy with the components installed on it. You can see the injectors and uh, the hoses going to the water uh, gate valves and the spark plug leads going back to the, the modified distributor. Yeah, when I see in the injector, uh, the top of it looks like a spark plug. It looks like a small uh, lawnmower spark plug on the top that a regular ignition coil wire would snap onto. Uh, the picture you see of them holding it in the 
uh, newscast has a little white plastic cover on it where you can't see that stuff. But then there's okay. a fitting that goes in the side for the water inlet, and then the the water the the gases uh, eject at the very tip where the threads are where it screws into the cylinder. Okay, so what we have here then is a is an injector spark plug that has a water line going to the side of it. It has a standard ignition wire, uh, what typically right. travels from the distributor to the spark plug. Right. From the distributor cap to the spark plug. That wire connects in the normal fashion to the tip of the spark plug, the injector yep. plug. Now, the energy that's passing through that wire is doing something very different, though, than a normal spark plug. It's actually... Right, yeah. See, the um, there is a... A VIC coil that goes in the system. It's his, you know, special made uh, voltage intensifier circuit coil. It's a step up transformer with the chokes and everything, the inductors all built into one unit. That would go and hook into the distributor cap, and then the uh, then you'd have the four leads coming out that went to each cylinder of the buggy. But there was the special VIC coil that fired that, and then inside the distributor was all the other components that were needed to make the whole system work. It, has a, it calls it a laser accelerator system. It's a modified because it was a stock distributor with a unit on top of it, and then the cap went on top of it. So it had, elect, uh, after his own electronics designs, in, incorporated into the factory distributor. And that's included in this offer to purchase all of his stuff? Oh, yeah, everything. Uh, but I it's not it's installed on the dune buggy? No, it's but uh, it, everything that I know should be there. I see in there. It's it's all okay. There. So we're not saying that each coil wire, each each uh, ignition wire going to each spark plug has a voltage intensifier circuit on it. Instead, no, there's, there's one just central. one. Yeah, there's just one master coil, just like a normal car would have, but it's his own special uh, high voltage, you know, amp restricting uh, circuit. Now, how do you understand what's taking place inside that injector plug then? The, the, the piston uh, comes up for the compression stroke. Is that when the, it goes into action, or is it when yeah, it, it fires? The stroke? Yeah, what it does is it doesn't actually fire the hydrogen or nothing when the water passages passes through the voltage zones on the inside of that injector. It converts it instantly into the the gases, and it itself ignites by the time it comes out the tip of that plug. So it's like a, a burner nozzle in a furnace. You put the water in, it just comes out as a flame at the end, and it's pulsed. Uh, the water is pulsed through the injector just like a fuel injector on your car is. It's controlled by the, the computer that pulses each. There was four solenoids on the car that uh, injects the water into the injector. So it's an injection process, and it injects it right, at the, right around top dead center, probably a little after top dead center, and it's just, it just explodes and forces the piston back down. So are we saying then that the four-cycle engine doesn't need to be a four-cycle engine for this type of fuel system? Uh, that I haven't really thought In about. In other words, you're, you don't have an intake stroke and a compression stroke, right? Well, you're still, yeah, you're still sucking in outside air. That air, there's also processed air that is entered into the system through the, uh, there's an ambient air processor that injects uh, processed air. He ionizes some air and sends it through the intake. And he also uh, sends in some exhaust recirculation back into the intake. That's all to uh, control the burn rate. Uh, when that ex when that fire comes out the end of that plug, it's pretty explosive. So you're putting in some a lot of non-combustible gases along with some ionized air to enhance the the burn. And uh, it's a, it's a mix of three things at once. Okay, so you're taking in an atmospheric air mix along with some exhaust gases and some ionized air. Yes. You're, you're, you're taking it in during the intake stroke. You're compressing yes. it during the compression stroke. Yes. But you're not trying to burn it. You're not igniting it. You're igniting the fuel that is being instantly, or simultaneously. Yeah, the uh, water that's being converted. is It's an instant explosion as the water passes through the injector, through the voltage zones. It does a conversion. and when it's ready, when it comes out the tip of that injector, it literally just comes out as a, a ball of fire. And then all those other gases in there uh, enhances the burn and slows it down because the hydrogen, you know, of course, burns so fast that it's, it's more of an explosion than a slow burn. So he's processing all the air that's being drawn in and compressed to uh, reduce that flame speed. He 
you see him in his video talking about adjusting the flame speed. That's what he was doing, was slowing down burn because it'd be like hitting that piston with a sledgehammer every time it goes off without this other treated gases in there. Okay. And so is there any evidence that this was actually tested and, and, and substantiated by outsiders or...? Mm, that I don't know. I've been talking with the owner, and uh, there's, he's got a whole bunch of uh, VCR tapes that he's never watched. And he says, what you need to do is sit down and start watching some of these tapes. And he says, you need to find some video of that engine running with those water fuel injectors in it, where you can literally see the motor running and those injectors are in the cylinders. I says, if you can find that, it says it's worth its weight in gold after that. Yeah. And you know what I wonder is why, if it's such an easy thing to do, to pop a, a video cassette into a, v, a VCR. Yeah. yeah. Why wouldn't he, he do that? He's a busy man, I can tell you that. He's, he really does. Yeah, but I, I don't think anyone is that busy, yeah. are they? I mean, there is just so much stuff there. That he I mean, people tend to kick their feet up and watch something as they come in yeah, and hire some work. Yeah, he said he's going to have to sit down and start watching some. He's he's a tough guy to get a hold of. Yeah, but you think that he would have uh, had something to brag about having watched those videos? And yeah, say, you know I, think I think I've got him convinced of doing that now. So he said, well, I'm going to have He was sorting through some stuff here. Uh, their power had was out down in that area from the uh, Hurricane Ike coming through, so he was out without power for like a week. Uh, so now it came back on. He was sorting through some stuff for paperwork and found some more things he was telling me about that I didn't see. And the one of the units I didn't see when I was there was the actual voltage intensifier coil, and he called to let me know that he did find one. He goes, I found one of them boxes, and the components are in it. Huh, very interesting. That was the only part that I didn't get to see when I was there. I got to see the boxes that I put a picture on on the web about of the VIC coil box, but it, you know, there's nothing in it. When okay, so you have boxes. posted pictures of all these things where? Um, the picture, Some of the pictures are on the waterfuelcell.org, and the other ones on and the And that's Yahoo. the Australian site? Yes, yeah, that's Murray's site in Australia. Murray Willis's site? Yes. Okay. And then the other place is um, the WFC Y2K Yahoo. Okay, this is a Yahoo chat group yes. called W? Um, WFC, Water Fuel Cell, Y2K. It's just six letters. Okay. Letters and number. So anyone who yeah. wants to become a member of that group can do so and have yeah, access to the files section. Yep. You have to be a member. There's nothing to sign on. Get into yeah, and then you can in. access the files and the photos and so on. Yeah, when I first uh, let this uh, be known that I found the stuff, the owner sent me a picture of the buggy. It's outside. You can see a little bit of snow on the ground. I posted that, and then he sent me the picture of the VIC coil box, a big aluminum box. I put that in there, and then he sent me a picture of the, the hydrogen gas gun, and I put that in there. So those three pictures are on both of those sites. So what do you understand the, the uh, function of the hydrogen gas gun to be? What is it actually doing? It's, What's its it, purpose? It's, yeah, okay, after you get the gases out of your actual water fuel cell, this has nothing to do with the injectors. It's almost like a, a rocket engine, basically. But what it does is as the gases come out of the cell, it passes through the hydrogen gas gun, which has all these LED lights on it, which he calls laser laser energy. He's hitting them with a specific light frequency from these LEDs. And all it's doing is, if you go through his um, patents, he explains that when the gases are separated, you still have the electrons orbiting the, the uh, hydrogen molecules and the oxygen molecules. By hitting them with this light energy, it causes those electrons to go into a farther orbit from the, the molecule. What he's doing is he's making the, the gases very unstable, the molecules. He's by moving these electrons into a farther orbit, uh, you know, like taking the moon and swinging it out farther from Earth, it becomes very unstable. And then once you ignite the gases, uh, everything's in chaos, and all matter wants to find equilibrium. It wants to return to equilibrium. So he's making it very unstable, so when that gas is lighted, now it becomes extremely more volatile. It, it just enhances the energy output of the gases if you were just to light it without doing this laser amplification. Very interesting. So when the conventional wisdom says you can't run a car on water because hydrogen has X number of BTUs of energy, 
Right. And Stan Meyer saying, here's a way to enhance the energy that you can get out of it. Right. He was taking it right down to the molecule level of energy, you know, like the atom, like splitting the atom. And, you know, it doesn't, very little small atom, when you split the thing, you got the atomic bomb. He's doing the same thing, but on a smaller scale. You know, he's not uh, going to that drastic stream, but there is a lot of energy <clears throat> in water, and, and that's what he was doing. He, I think what happened was, like your friend said, he'd seen the thing run and it didn't run very good because he was probably just burning the straight gases. And then he got into the ionizing the air, recirculating exhaust gases, the laser amplification, and he was taking that energy potential and just uh, making it greater and greater and greater until he finally had enough power to do what he wanted. Yeah. Well, it was obvious to me when you saw the first video that was on the Columbus uh, TV station that they didn't have the science down. I mean, I asked Charlie Holbrook, what were you doing standing on the back of the dune buggy? And he said, I was feeding it the hydrogen. Yeah. Well, I mean, if they'd had yeah. their act together at all, they, he wouldn't have needed someone to be standing behind him on the on the back of the thing yeah. operating the... the uh, yeah, that's what I mean. If you had a lot of shells in there, like say, you, you can only take so much to, uh, to make an engine idle, and then it takes progressively more as you accelerate. And then once you get to a a neutral speed, a constant speed of, you know, 55 mile an hour, then the, the flow will actually drop again. So he's he's increasing and decreasing the flow to, to keep up with the engine because it, they hadn't but had it. You know, what's uh, amazing uh, about that is that other people have mastered this using propane regulators and diaphragms sure. and so on, sure. propane carburetors. Well, what's funny is that someone can be such a genius to come up with these concepts and, and then actually build a device that's capable of producing the gas. But that doesn't mean that they're a master of carburation. Sure. You know? Yeah, I'm, my background, uh, I've I've been playing with uh, race, drag racing cars for 20-plus years, and I know fuel injection inside and out. I actually had a, a Dynajet chassis dyno where I would custom tune uh, fuel injected cars, and I'd go right into computers and program it. And that's why I tell the owner, I says, you know, the easiest thing to do with that technology is to put it in a furnace first, and it's the easiest thing to set up. And then the next thing would be to do a gen set where you've got an engine that's running at a constant speed. It says once you throw in the the, uh, the variable throttle controls of an automobile engine, it says you've just quadrupled the, the effort to make it run. It says you started out with the hardest thing you could possibly do. That's, I mean, after, you know, knowing what I know about tuning cars, I mean, there is a lot to go into uh, setting up a program to make an engine run at all loads where you can go out on a cold day, start the car, take off. Or if, you, if you're familiar with driving old carburetor cars in the old days, you couldn't do that. And that's kind of where he was at. You know, he had the gases, but he just had to control it better. Yeah. It's very well, complicated. It is. And so you can't expect someone to be adept at everything. You right. Know? And you can't expect them to be a perfect marketer of their technology either. And right. if you... If you point to Meyer's paranoia or his failure to promote it successfully during his lifetime so that by the time he died unexpectedly, it wasn't able to be marketed, you know. Uh, yeah. No one could run with it. And that's really a testimony to the fact that none of us has all the the bases covered. You know? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of uh, knowledge needed to do what he was trying. And then he... I, uh, the owner says that he was like one of these guys where he'd get something, he'd get it working, he said, okay, now, and then he'd go off and work on something else, some other oh, home cool. heating, yeah. air conditioning. He'd get something where it would work, and then he would jump into something else without finishing what he started. So he was just constantly bouncing around trying well, to... Well, look at it this way. If the powers that be wanted to run with his technology at an early date, they could have. Right. He wasn't going to... He was trying to get it marketed, mm -hmm. and yes, he perhaps he wanted uh, it done his way, but... I think that if a reasonable offer had been made by someone truly interested in, in putting it on their vehicles, one of the major automakers or whatever, or furnaces, for whatever reason, it has so many applications, he would have allowed it to, be, to have been mass-produced and marketed by someone who had that sincere desire and manifested it to him. Yeah. But I, I just don't think that, that yeah, ever happened. Yeah, like in the videos I've, I've bought and off of the water fuel cell, dot uh, org. He has uh, some DVDs. Uh, the lectures he gives. He says, you know, this has to be, you know, made in the garage by an individual. Because as soon as you hire somebody to develop a part for you, he was afraid that someone could come in, do a corporate takeover of the place, and then once that technology was designed and they build it, 
and, and you needed to make your system work, you could no longer continue your work because they, they're the owner of the park now if they wanted to suppress it. So he was always paranoid that people were going to steal his work. So he had to do everything himself to protect it. Yeah, and you know, he had some bad experiences before he ever got into this alternative energy pursuit. And I know in one case, one of his supervisors was looking over his shoulder, stole one of his ideas, and then marketed it, mm-hmm. and, and was the recipient of the benefits from that that technology. Yeah. I think it had to do with a dollar bill changer. Yeah. And that's I can't remember the name of the company he was working for at the from. time. I'm sorry? I said, that's probably where he got his paranoia from. Yeah, he had already been burned. Yeah, already been for, burned. You know, anybody who's who's a design genius who comes up with concepts and then finds that someone nearby has stolen them is is going to make you twice shy. Yeah, I know. Well, there's a lot of people, you know, on these sites have been, you know, saying that I'm a fraud and this stuff's all a fraud. It's not real. And, you know, seeing the stuff firsthand, I can tell you for sure that this is stand stuff. Everything you can see on it, there's nothing on that buggy that was high tech i mean everything you can tell was made he made it himself everything was done just with you know hand operated lathes and mills it was everything was made you know you can tell he made it personally there was nothing store bought on that machine at all everything was handmade just by the materials he used but everything was there everything that should be there that i there was no when i saw the stuff there was there was nothing on there that surprised me there wasn't anything on there that i did not expect to see I was hoping to see some more stuff, but it was that simple. It was as simple as he showed in all his patterns. It's, yeah. There was nothing hidden. And as far as uh, a price, uh, do you, have you any idea what the, the top dollar that's been offered for all the stuff is? Uh, right now it's still in the uh, mid-$70,000 range. It really hasn't gone over. I mean, the, there was original offer on the table of 70000 when I first uh, brought it out, and there's only been two, maybe three people that have literally talked and uh, made offers, but it's still only like mid-70s. It's uh, They're still waiting for people to get back to them, but... It's okay, and as far really as uh, contact information, if somebody does want to table an offer, um, yeah, what, right what now they still address? have to contact me. You know, through what would your email address, address be? Uh, Dino Don, that's D Y N O D O N six four at Verizon dot net. Okay, and is the seller laying down any kind of stipulation about not shelving the technology? The oh yeah, he, yeah. He does not. He wants to see whoever gets this. He wants to see them to work at, promote, get it working if it works. And you know, he wants to see this out there. He does not want to see it shelved. He says if if an oil company came in, he knew they were from big oil and were offering him ten million dollars for the thing, and somebody else was offering him a million dollars that he knows would do something with it. He would not sell it to. Uh, he's not going to sell it to the highest bidder without knowing what they're going to do with it. But yeah. on the same hand, he's not going to sell it without having some kind of percentage in any sales that come about uh, getting this thing out there to the public either. You know, they're, if he's going to make some money, he expects he can make the money on the on the selling end. You know, yeah, well, Meyer said that he was public. offered a billion dollars cash. Mm, I, not... The way Stan words it, and he says over the years he's been offered over a billion. I think he might have added up all the offers together. But I don't think he was actually offered a billion up front. I, the way he says it in the videos, it almost sounds like, you know, they offered him millions, 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 and it all added up to over a billion dollars. That's what I take from what he said. Very interesting. And yet, in the final analysis, he might as well have accepted the money because nothing's happened with it anyway. Right, right. I mean, I you know, I mean, if it's not being... I'm sorry? I was I was surprised that after all these years that it was still around. I never expected to find the thing. When I did, it was like, wow, that's amazing. Because once I seen that report in the Columbus Dispatch, it's like it's still there. And I says, why is anybody looking for this thing? And then well, I the talked interesting to the owner, thing. and he says that nobody's ever called or inquired, or you know, he's never heard anybody looking for it other than the people that knew where it was, and those were the people that he was negotiating with until the 16th of August. But there well, maybe people. things will change now that this uh, program has called yeah, well, to the just, fact that it's available. Well, yeah, people, you know, think that we're trying to fraud. And I said, no, I said, you know, you guys ought to be happy to find out the thing is still out there. You know, everyone thought the government came in and took it away, I mean, but that never happened. So I figured people would be, you know, happy to know that's here. And then at the very least, when the thing's sold, 
I'm hoping the owner will let me know who gets it so we can keep an eye on it and make sure it doesn't disappear again. Yeah, wouldn't it be nice to uh, to find out that someone with uh, both the funds necessary to acquire it and the desire to, you know, bring it to market? Yeah, so bring far all the people that have called me and the couple that I've sent on and the people that are also that they're, he's talking with, uh, I mean, they all have that hope to uh, get the thing working and promote it. I mean, the Orion Project that most people know are one of the people that has an offer in. Uh, they posted some pictures on their website, the Orion oh, Project. Great. After I well, posted my pictures, they had pictures that they had taken uh, earlier in the year when they went and saw it, and then they posted their pictures of the stuff while they looked at it. So, Well, that's good to know. So I'm not and the only person that knows where it is right now. I mean, there's at least a half a dozen piece of people I know that know where it is and who has it. So I'm not the only person to know. Well, then there are developments all over the world happening right now, and some of it is based on Meyer's work, which, you know, validates the work that he did, the fact that, you know, as they say, imitation is right. a sincerest form of flattery. Yes. There are people all over the world that are claiming to have replicated certain aspects of his technology. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's promising. Yeah, I've, I've read of two people who have claimed to have done it. There was a Ted Zettergren from France who claimed to have been the first one to have done it, and then there was another fellow over here in the States called uh, Tad Johnson who claims to have done it, but he said it was such a hard thing to maintain the resonance. Once he said it took a long time to find it, and then it would run for a little bit, and then it would quit because something would change. It was so temperamental that you could not stay on lock, and he was just doing manual adjusting. But... He claims to have done it. He was on the uh, the YFC, WFC Y2K group, and when it mm-hmm. first started a few years ago, he was in. Now, what about project. your own your own work? What are you doing? Own experiments. Things? I've pretty much like everybody. I started out with the Lawton uh, circuit and played with that, and then the more I read uh, Stan's work, uh, Stan emphasizes a 50% duty cycle, and then the Lawton circuit will not maintain 50% when you adjust frequency. So, so I've been uh, playing with circuits that only generate a clean 50% duty cycle. and I mean, it works. It's just a matter of attenu- attenuating the voltage. It's just a matter of getting that VIC coil to get the voltage to the cell. So right now I'm in the middle of a new generator and trying to get the bugs worked out of it. But it's just a little tinkering every now and then when I got yeah, Well, it's good to hear that you're a hands-on kind of guy and you're working on it. Yeah, I'm not just looking. I've been playing, like I said, I've been at this for a couple of years. I've played with some of Bob Boyce's stuff, and I've done some of that. I've got an alternator all converted, ready to test on a multi-tube cell. So, well, it's good to hear it. Don, why don't we uh, do a follow-up interview to, after uh, we allow some time for things to transpire? Sure. And perhaps we can talk to you also about your experience in in getting into the computer and actually reprogramming it. That's, that's very helpful for... Oh, yeah, it's, I mean, there's a ton of, I, I had, a, I was a dealer for a SCT, which was Super Chips Custom Tuning, uh, where I would uh, buy the chips and burn them and put them in the computers, and then uh, I also would uh, sell the units that I could program and sell them to customers, and they could literally go in and do the timing and fuel changes themselves, correct for tire gear ratios. It, uh, there's a lot of companies out there now. You, if you can't find one for your car, you're not looking. I mean, yeah. you everything out there. And so what people want to know is how they can get a hydrogen booster to perform better. Oh, or to achieve. I'll tell you what, when you're talking OBD2, 96 and newer, you've got your hands full. And the problem with boosters is, is the, the flow coming out of it is constant. It doesn't vary. If you've got a booster that makes 1.5 liters a minute, you've got a 1.5 liters a minute when it's idling, you've got 1.5 liters a minute when it's full throttle. So you've got a real problem there of trying to maintain a, a good air-fuel ratio. All well, that's where an Australian has just this week suggested making a Venturi. Now, I know uh, Zero Fossil Fuel also posted such a, yeah, I mean, not made out of plastic wine glasses, but he posted one made out of PVC pipe mm-hmm. sometime earlier this year, or maybe last year it was, actually, where there's a small gas feed tube in the midst of this pipe that is, I guess you'd say beveled, so it's venturi shaped like a venturi effect yes and yeah, so that's something to watch what i was looking to do i built a you know a smack booster and uh played with it on my car just to see what the oxygen sensors would do but 
my I have a Mustang with a 347 supercharged, you know, 800 horse car, and I hooked it on there, just let it idle to watch the oxygen sensor outputs, and it, a mine puts out maybe 1.2 liters a minute, but it, it didn't have enough gas to affect the readings. So, but if you get into a four cylinder car, then then that's when you're going to start seeing it show up in your oxygen sensors. I mean, you've got to be able to get around that. The best thing you could do was, like on these late modern-day cars, they all have mass air meters. What you would really need to do is tie into that mass air meter and control the voltage or the power going to the cell and have that cell increase and decrease as airflow increases and decreases into your engine. That's about the yeah. only way you could really do it right. Well, and what this Australian, Lyle Bailey is his name, he's actually a uh, a model airplane builder. This is what he's done as a career. He's an older fellow, I guess, maybe 60, 70 years old. And yep, I've been there. What, I'm actually building a home-built experimental aircraft myself. Well, you might want to com communicate with him then. Absolutely. He's on, on one of the one or two of the groups. But the point being that the, the meditation that, that resulted in this idea was that if a vehicle can climb to high altitude, and unlike the old carbureted vehicles that would slow down and even die while crossing the Rockies, for example, yeah, flood out. A, a newer vehicle is capable of adjusting down the altitude fuel injection based on the restricted oxygen. Yeah, it's all based on your uh, barometric pressure readings. It, as you go higher in altitude, the engine, the air, the air gets leaner and leaner in the oxygen content. So what happens is your engine gets richer and richer and richer. I'm also a private pilot, so I fly airplanes as well. So when, uh, as you go up in altitude, there's a mixture control on an airplane. You pull it to lean the carburetor out because they're carbureted. So yeah, as you go up in altitude, you have to lean out the mixture. And with uh, <coughs> with a car with carburetors, they'd pull it out, but fuel injection automatically compensates for the conditions because of the barometric pressure sensor. It automatically reads the pressure and compensates for it. Yeah, very, very interesting. So the the, the idea that was uh, arrived at is that if the vehicle is able to detect that change in pressure or oxygen level, right. then why not restrict the airflow into the engine using this Venturi so that the resulting combustion reflects that lower oxygen content? Um, well, the well, what you're talking about, if, if you're getting up in altitude, the air is already being restricted, and that's the problem. Uh, you're getting too much fuel. You, you need to add... Uh, you need to pull fuel out to compensate for the, the lower air flow. The, the Which air the vehicle is does, right? Restricting. So on the newer vehicles, there is a restricted fuel flow under this circumstance, right? Yeah, the computer has a sensor that monitors atmospheric outside air pressure, and as you go up in altitude, the, the pressure readings go lower and lower, so the computer automatically compensates and pulls back the fuel. Where the exactly power also is that drops. sensor? The barometric pressure sensor is that inside the air um, intake plenum? A lot of the newer computers depends on you know foreign domestic. Uh, some of them are in the actual computer now. Uh, some of them used to be a sensor when they were hooked to the engine. They used to be called a MAP sensor, manifold absolute pressure, and that was before mass air came along. So then once mass air came, that MAP sensor now be was turned into a BAP sensor, BAP, barometric absolute pressure. So, but a lot of them are now internal in the computer. So just a little chip on the board that can re register pressure automatically in the computer. And so that would be an easy that would be an easy way to deal with this situation, wouldn't it? <clears throat> it helps. Uh, I mean, the computers, car computers, are only programmed to work around lambda of 1.0, which is your 14.7 to 1 air fuel ratio. And the biggest hurdle we have is to uh, you can literally go in and reprogram the car the computer to run at a different air fuel ratio. But the problem is you need a different type of oxygen sensor. A lot of the newer cars use a wideband oxygen sensor, which would allow you to change that air fuel ratio. Uh, the standard O2 sensors, which are narrow band, you can't go richer or leaner than that 14.7 to 1 by very much. Once you go left or right of 14.7 on the ratio table, the oxygen sensor is not accurate. It's only it was only designed to operate at one ratio. When computer sees the a voltage which is higher than 0.45 volts, it knows it's rich. If it sees it's lower than 
0.45, it knows it's lean. So the computer just looks rich, lean, rich, lean. Whereas a wideband sensor, it can literally tell the computer what the air-fuel ratio is. So if you can reprogram, reflash the computer with a new air-fuel ratio, it'll, it'll hold that ratio for you. Cause it and you're enough. capable of doing that? Yeah, with uh, certain models. I don't have software to do them all anymore. I've, I've gotten out of it now, so I'm not doing it anymore. I just got tired of it. But this shows the complications of it, because not all vehicles sure. respond the same. You have to have the no, software for individual vehicles. Yeah, every every manufacturer has a different program. I mean, they all have the same basic systems. There's three programs in a computer. You've got idle, part throttle, and wide open throttle. There's three modes of operability. And when you're when you start your car, you're in the idle mode. And when you start driving, you go to part throttle. And then after maybe 60, 70 percent throttle, you get into wide open throttle. And each one of those, you can go in and program any one of them and it will not affect the other two. Uh, so, <clears throat> but there's a ton of programming in there, and you really got to understand this stuff to, to do it. Not anybody can do it. So when you buy these flash tuners you can order from, you know, Summit Racing or anybody like that, they give you very minimal things that you can adjust. But it allows you, and if you change your rear end gears or put bigger tires or smaller tires on it, that's going to throw your speedometer off because it's all controlled by the computer now. Oh, they allow you to correct all that stuff. If you go put bigger injectors in, bigger mass air meter, better flowing heads, camshafts, they give you some areas where you can adjust. But if you need a real serious change where you've taken a four-cylinder and went from a 100-horse to a 300-horse motor, that's going to take a total reconfiguration of the program to make it work. And you were the guy to have to do that. Yeah, I used to do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. My, a well, 302 Mustang, you know, it's 800 horsepower. Yeah. I, I, well, our our 15 minute interview has stretched to an hour, yeah. so I'd say there's there's uh, room for us to do another interview in, in the next few weeks and see what's happened with Myers Dune mm -hmm. Buggy, and also consider some of these other important uh, aspects of um, boosting a a gasoline engine and so on. Yeah, boosting is not bad. I mean, it's you just got to have an understanding of the 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 computer to really make it work right. Well, we're looking for a simple fix that's across the board uh, for all vehicles. Problem. It just isn't one. That's the biggest thing. There isn't one. I mean, well, with a, like say the newer computers with the wideband sensors, you have a better chance of doing it. But the older systems that have what they call narrow bands, which 90% of the cars have, it's going to be a real problem to get around. Okay. Well, listen, Don, thanks so much. Um, yeah. We might just mention your email address again. It's dino. Don? Dino Don64 at Verizon.net. Okay, very Everybody good. And I'll go ahead and post that on the Blog Talk Radio page as well. Yeah. I'm on I'm on that uh, WSC Y2K Yahoo group and uh, the, the uh, waterfuelcell.org. I mean, you can get through me through both of those. I've gotten very out good. of a bunch of the other ones. So. Well, I thank you so much for your time. I'm sure this has been very informative for our listening audience. I appreciate it, and I thank everyone for tuning in as well. Okay, thank you, James. All right, take care. Mm -hmm. Bye.